Hello. Uh, I hope that you're well uh, this week. Um, I wanted to uh, continue with our lectures and move on to the 1980s. Uh, this week, uh, this week and next week, we'll be talking about the 1980s. Uh, this week, we'll, we'll talk about Margaret Thatcher uh, and talk about some of the political and economic changes uh, that took place in Great Britain and in Western Europe, or, the, or indeed the Western world, uh, during the 1980s, um, and talk about some of the changes uh, that took place then. Uh, and then next week, I want to switch over and talk a little bit about Perestroika and talk about the Soviet Union. Uh, under Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the general secretary uh, from 1985 onwards, um, and talk about how uh, his coming to power in the Soviet Union uh, began a, a series of very important changes uh, in the Soviet Union, which would have uh, um, extremely uh, uh, consequential, uh, would, would be extremely consequential also uh, for um, uh, those parts of Europe, Eastern and Central Europe, that were under communism. Um, but before I begin uh, the, this week's lectures, before I begin this week's session, um, I just wanted to very quickly update you uh, on the first assignment. Now, according to the, uh, uh, the course booklet, uh, the first assignment is due uh, at the end of this week. Um, but because things are a little bit strange at the moment, uh, and uh, because we're all trying to adapt to these uh, um, new circumstances and this, this you know, these sort of uh, um, uh, improvised circumstances that the, uh, that the corona outbreak has imposed upon us and the, the closure has imposed upon us, uh, what I've decided to do is extend the deadline for the first assignment um, one by one week up until uh, Friday the 3rd of April. Um, and I've set up on the Moodle site uh, an area um, where you can uh, download your uh, download your assignments online. Obviously, we we will not be uh, taking any paper copies. We won't be exchanging. Uh, I won't be able to get into the university. Nobody can to, to sort of submit or pick up essays. Uh, so everything will be done online. Um, and uh, there's a section at the bottom uh, of the Moodle page for Fractured Continent where you'll be able to uh, uh, to upload your essays. Um, and if you have any problems with any anything like that, uh, um, just uh, send me an email, and we can try to work out a uh, work out some kind of alternative. But that submission should work. Uh, should be able to should be able to do that. Um, now the other thing is that if anybody wants to sort of have a quick consultation, uh, for sort of ten or fifteen minutes, uh, um, about their assignment, if they have any questions. Uh, you can certainly put those to me uh, via email. You can contact me um, on the email that I'm contacting you and that I've uh, provided to you. Uh, but I can also set up some time uh, where we can, if you wish, have a quick Skype session or a Zoom session uh, um, if there's anything you want to ask me uh, about your essay. And the best time for me to do is would be Tuesday afternoon uh, after 4 p.m., uh, 4 p.m. check time. Um, so if you want to set something up, then uh, if you want to sort of talk to me uh, online in person uh, about anything having to do with the course, but particularly uh, with the first assignment, um, then uh, just give me an email uh, and we can set up an appointment on Tuesday. That's Tuesday, the 31st of, uh, um, of March. Um, and we can uh, we can sort of discuss uh, discuss things then. OK, so let's go to the slides then. Uh, um, like I say, uh, this week uh, we want, I want to talk about the 1980s. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, this woman. Uh, if we turn now to slide number two, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, born in 1925, uh, died in, 19, in 2013. Uh, and I guess I could begin with a, with a small anecdote uh, um, uh, having to do with when uh, Margaret Thatcher died. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, of course, was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, as we'll, as we'll find out in today's uh, lecture, uh, throughout pretty much all of the 1980s. Uh, she came to power uh, in the United Kingdom uh, at the end of the 1970s and was eventually ousted by her own party uh, um, in 1990. Uh, so she ruled Great Britain uh, uh, throughout the 1980s. Now, it was a very divisive period. Uh, people uh, have very strong feelings towards Thatcher either way. Uh, some people think very highly of her, uh, and some people think very lowly indeed. Now, in 2013, I was in Edinburgh uh, uh, visiting friends uh, when it was announced that Margaret Thatcher had died. Uh, she'd been ill for a very long time, and she'd been suffering from dementia. Uh, so she'd been off the, uh, um, out of the public eye for some years. Uh, but in 2013 she died uh, and I remember uh, uh, I was in a pub with, uh, with, some, with some friends 
uh, uh, in a Scottish pub and, and Margaret Thatcher was not particularly popular in Scotland. Uh, and there was this huge kind of uproar, uh, uh, this cheer, if you like, and, and in your sort of free drinks and uh, um, uh, people were very sort of gleeful uh, um, at, uh, at Margaret Thatcher's death, uh, you know, really, really sort of happy. Uh, that this woman, uh, this woman had died. It was, it was quite extraordinary, and and, and you know I've I've, I've been in uh, countries like Bosnia uh, when uh, um, you know when very famous, very sort of uh, um, high ranking war criminals uh, who inflicted suffering on that country died, uh, and I didn't see such scenes of celebration and such scenes of glee. Uh, um, so it was a very strange thing, and and, and about, about a week later, Margaret Thatcher uh, was treated to a state funeral. Uh, an honour uh, uh, which had not been, uh, she was the first Prime Minister to receive this honour uh, in Great Britain since since Winston Churchill, uh, since the great wartime leader. Um, so, uh, you know, on the one hand, there were many people who, who felt very uh, uh, bad about her and, and, and had very bad, uh, very, very bad feelings towards her. But at the same time, there are very many people, including many within the political establishment, uh, who thought very highly of her. Now, either way, whatever you think, she was indeed a very important person. Uh, um, she transformed uh, not only Great Britain, uh, its politics, uh, um, its economy, but also its society. Um, but it also transformed attitudes, I think, throughout Europe uh, um, uh, and indeed throughout the Western world. Uh, her approach to politics, uh, her, her ideas and her attitudes um, towards particularly political economy uh, and what the state should do. Uh, for its citizens, for its subjects, um, uh, was very influential uh, um, uh, in Great Britain, uh, but in other parts of Europe as well. Uh, and, and her ideas are still very uh, um, important uh, um, in the 21st century. Okay, now let, let's have a quick recap. If we move to slide number three, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I told you, uh, remember, about what happened in Great Britain at the end of the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, I told you that uh, um, Clement Attlee, uh, the Labour leader, swept into power in a landslide, um, defeating Winston Churchill and his popularity and the popularity of his programme had a lot to do uh, uh, with his reorganisation, his proposed reorganisation of the welfare state. Um, he promised uh, Britain's uh, um, a much more extensive welfare uh, programme of welfare, kind of what we call today a cradle to the grave welfare. Um, and we spoke about how free education, um, uh, free health care, uh, uh, workers insurance, disability allowance, all of these sorts of things, uh, um, which had not been comprehensively uh, uh, in existence in Great Britain or, or really in anywhere in, in, in Europe before the Second World War, uh, were introduced at the end of the Second World War by Clement Attlee's Labour uh, government. Um, and these became foundational principles. Uh, of uh, the post-war settlement uh, and the welfare state. Uh, uh, we, we, we talked about Great Britain, but I, I also told you, didn't I, uh, that the welfare state, this kind of cradle to the grave welfare, uh, was also introduced in other parts of Europe. So in places like France, um, in West Germany, of course, in Scandinavia, uh, um, throughout Western Europe, so throughout non-communist Europe, uh, um, this kind of welfare uh, uh, became one of the, the, the sort of the foundational uh, points of the post-war, uh, the post-war social contract. Now that lasted. That worked out well, uh, um, at least initially. Uh, on uh, um, on uh, slide number four, uh, remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the affluent society. Uh, I talked about how uh, uh, um, in Europe uh, um, in the nineteen fifties, you know, again, again Western Europe in the 1950s and the 1960s underwent this incredible sort of reconstruction, uh, this incredible sort of economic miracle. Uh, um, so that by the time we get to the 1960s, uh, uh, Europeans, Western Europeans, are enjoying a level of luxury and of affluence, uh, which, you know, generally speaking, they have not enjoyed uh, um, before that, or, or the people who enjoyed such things were only a very small percentage um, of, uh, of the societies of the populations in question. Um, in the 1960s, uh, um, throughout the 1960s, really, uh, um, things were going very well uh, for very large portions of society. Uh, uh, people were, were enjoying prosperity. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, more leisure time, uh, more, uh, uh, more sort of, you know, more, uh, more disposable income, more money, um, and people were doing pretty, pretty well. Now, in, in such a period, you can imagine, uh, when things are going well economically, people don't question... Uh, that much uh, the fundamentals of, of, of sort of political economy 
uh, and uh, uh, economic organization. So if, if during this time people were very prosperous and very wealthy, uh, um, you know, people would not be questioning this kind of post-war social contract. Uh, they weren't questioning universal health care. They weren't questioning... Uh, universal, uh, uh, universal education. They weren't questioning this very, this this very sort of generous, uh, um, uh, cradle to the grave welfare uh, 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 system that Clement Attlee's government had put in. When the times were good, people were, were, were most people, not everyone, of course, but most people were willing to sort of let things continue, um, as they went along. Now things changed very dramatically um, at the beginning of the nineteen seventies. Um, if we move into slide number five. Um, I, I, I won't go into to, to why things changed in too much detail, uh, um, because essentially what happened happened outside of Europe. And, and, and of course, we're first and foremost concerned uh, um, with developments within Europe itself. But, but just very briefly, um, at the beginning of the 1970s, uh, um, Israel, so we're, we're talking about now the Middle East, uh, um, Israel went to war uh, uh, with uh, several of its Arab neighbors, Jordan, Egypt, uh, uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, uh, by and large, the Western European governments and, of course, the, you know, the NATO governments uh, and, and the U.S. government uh, supported uh, uh, Israel, were supportive uh, of Israel after this kind of attack uh, um, and this conflict. Now, this was not to the liking of the Arab world, uh, particularly uh, the so-called OPEC countries, so the Organization of Petroleum Exporting uh, Countries, uh, uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, countries like Bahrain, uh, Gulf state countries, very oil-rich countries. Uh, uh, they had uh, been very critical of Israel. Uh, um, they were supportive uh, uh, of the Arab states in this conflict at the beginning of the 1970s. Um, and as a kind of punishment uh, uh, towards the Western world, uh, the OPEC countries, the oil-producing countries, uh, unilaterally hiked the price of oil uh, by I think about fifty percent. Um, I can't, can't exactly remember the numbers, but but they will be in uh, um, uh, they will be in Buchanan's book. Now this had a catastrophic effect on uh, um, on uh, um, on on European economies, on Western European economies, Western economies. Uh, um, then as now, to a great extent. Uh, um, Western economies ran on petrol, you know, freight, delivery, uh, 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 utilities, uh, um, production, factories, industry. Um, all of these sorts of things uh, uh, relied uh, uh, on, you know, on being profitable uh, um, and being efficient, economically efficient, relied on stable oil prices. So when the OPEC countries jacked up the price of oil uh, uh, by the stratospheric amount, uh, um, it had a catastrophic uh, impact uh, um, on, the, uh, um, on the economies in question. Now, this is the beginning uh, um, of the end, if you like, of the golden age, what, what is called the golden age uh, um, in Western European society and Western European economies. Um, the oil shock uh, um, had, this, had this kind of catastrophic effect uh, on the, uh, the Western European economies. Uh, um, the affluent age uh, um, of the end of the 1950s and the 1960s uh, really came crashing to an end. Um, and the Western economies and the Western European economies throughout the 1970s entered a period of recession. Um, so the kind of crisis uh, uh, that we saw uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Europe and in the West, and indeed in much of the world, uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, um, you know, with the financial crash of 2008, in 2009, uh, um, something, something like that, something very similar to that happened uh, in, uh, in Western Europe um, at the beginning of the 1970s as a result uh, of this oil shock. There was a second oil shock uh, uh, later on in the 1970s, I think in 1978 or 1979. Uh, um, so any chance of a quick recovery, any chance of sort of uh, uh, the Western European economies lifting themselves out uh, of this, uh, um, of the economic crisis that they found themselves in uh, were very remote and were very small indeed. So, like I say, it's the, it's the end uh, um, of the so-called golden age of, um, of Western European economies, uh, um, uh, uh, and the West doesn't really fully recover for a very long time, really not until the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, um, so the period going onwards, the period of the 1970s and the 1980s, the period that we're talking about this week, uh, um, is marked by this economic downturn, by this recession, um, and by the sense throughout the countries, uh, um, you know, throughout the countries in question, 
uh, um, that economic orthodoxies uh, that have been held since the end of the First World War um, now uh, need to be questioned. Okay, uh, um, so that, that's really kind of summed up in, in, uh, um, in, uh, um, in slide number six. Uh, um, or the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the points that I've been making. Um, the, the crisis, the economic crisis of the 1970s, you know, high unemployment, uh, spiraling, uh, uh, you know, lowering wages, spiraling costs, uh, um, all of the sorts of things that, that, that are routinely associated uh, with, uh, um, with economic crisis uh, came into being in, in the 1970s. Now, what this meant was um, that for many people now, uh, uh, the dogmas of the past, uh, uh, the economic verities, the economic truths, um, as I say, were called into question. Uh, um, all of a sudden, uh, um, people, were st people were starting to wonder and people were starting to question whether uh, uh, this extremely generous uh, uh, program of social welfare uh, um, could be sustained, was sustainable. Uh, people were starting to ask for the first time, well, look, uh, um, you know, when we had this affluence, uh, when we were doing very well uh, um, in the 1950s, the end of the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, um, we could afford uh, uh, um, to pay for education, we could afford to, afford to pay, pay for health, uh, we could afford to pay, uh, um, you know, workers' insurance, uh, disability allowances, all of these sorts of things. That was fine when we had the money. Uh, but the point is that now we don't have the money. Uh, um, and so we have to start saving um, and we have to start questioning uh, whether we can afford the kind of things uh, 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 that we used to afford. So the economic crisis is essentially calling into question uh, um, many of the principles uh, um, of political economy that have been held dear uh, uh, um, by European, by Western European societies since the end of the Second World War. So the kind of things uh, um, we talked about a few weeks ago when I talked about Clement Attlee's victory in, the, uh, um, in, in Great Britain and when I talked about um, the, uh, um, uh, when I talked about the post where post post-war welfare contract that was established in, in the United Kingdom, but in other parts of, uh, um, in other parts of Europe as well. Um, people, people were fundamentally questioning things that they had not questioned before. Uh, uh, they were questioning uh, uh, the extent uh, um, of the role of the state in people's lives. Uh, they were questioning uh, um, the, the amount of money that the state could spend on people, on welfare, on these sorts of things. Now, if we leap forward, of course, this is not an unusual uh, uh, um, question uh, that, that, that states ask of themselves. It's, it's, in fact, it's an ongoing one. Uh, um, it's very often the case, isn't it? And we, we, we saw that, and many of you will probably remember, we saw that uh, um, about a decade ago uh, when uh, we went through this economic downturn. Uh, um, many of the states throughout Europe imposed programs of austerity, uh, um, so drastically reduced public spending, uh, uh, um, you know, shrinking the economy, shrinking state, uh, uh, states, state expenditure on things like welfare. Uh, I mean, in this way, hoping to sort of, sort of get through these crises uh, uh, with the minimal amount, minimal amount of damage possible. Um, so when there's less money, when there are these kind of crises, people do start to question uh, 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 political orthodoxies and economic orthodoxies and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, so that was precisely what was happening in the 1970s. Now, if we, if we flip, to st flip to page, uh, uh, flip to slide number seven, uh, um, I want to introduce you very briefly to two of the key thinkers uh, um, who came to sort of uh, embody, uh, who came to be the embodiment uh, um, of new ideas uh, um, about political economy and the new role of the state. Uh, and these are people that some of you may have heard about uh, before. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, an Austrian uh, political economist, and uh, Milton Friedman, uh, um, his protege, his pupil uh, um, at the University of Chicago, an American, uh, um, an American economist. Now let's start with Hayek, um, and I'll, I'll just very briefly adumbrate uh, their ideas. I won't go into a huge amount of detail. Uh, um, I'll just try to summarize them and, and, and summarize their ideas, uh, which became very influential uh, um, uh, to many of the people uh, that we'll be talking about in this, uh, um, in this lecture. So let's start with Hayek. Um, as I say, Hayek was an Austrian, uh, um, and he had grown up um, in Austria in the first half uh, of the 20th century, so in the 1920s and the 1930s. He'd briefly been a student uh, um, at the University of Vienna. Uh, um, and after that, uh, when the Nazis came to power, uh, which they did uh, in Austria in 1938, when, when Austria was annexed, 
uh, by Nazi Germany, uh, uh, Hayek uh, uh, quite soon fled uh, um, Austria uh, uh, and ended up as an exile, I think, in, in uh, um, uh, ultimately in the United States of America. Um, and his ideas were very much shaped uh, um, by what was then called um, the totalitarian uh, states uh, um, of the 20th century. So Nazi Germany, uh, uh, but also uh, the Soviet Union. And he had a very negative response. I was very critical, of course, of, of, of those two countries uh, um, and, and those two societies. And Hayek uh, um, made sort of arguments. Uh, um, you know, he, look, he looked at those two states. He looked at Nazi Germany um, and he looked at the Soviet Union uh, um, and he kind, of, he, he kind of put forward arguments that said, uh, um, you know, those states were very, you know, they were very totalitarian. Uh, they sought to control uh, uh, almost all aspects of, of society and of the state uh, um, and almost all aspects of people's lives as well. Um, and for Hayek, one, of part, one part of this, uh, one part of this complete control uh, was also control of the economy. And of course, the Soviet Union uh, um, and, the, and the replica socialist states in Eastern and Central Europe, as, as, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, um, were, you know, it, with the exception of Yugoslavia, uh, um, at least initially exercised complete control uh, um, and complete planning um, over the national economies. They had their five-year plans, you know, the Stalinist industrialization programs and this kind of thing uh, rested on complete state control uh, um, of the economy. Uh, um, and this is also true uh, um, of the political organization um, of, of the right-wing totalitarian states. So Italy and Germany uh, um, also had this very kind of corporatist uh, control uh, um, of the national economy. So Hayek kind of made this uh, um, uh, made this parallel, uh, made this made, made this link uh, between political totalitarianism, political unfreedom, if you like, and uh, um, an economic unfreedom. Now, in, in in the United States after the Second World War, Frederick Frederick Hayek started to develop some ideas. Uh, um, about uh, the role of the state and about political economy, which are very much clouded, uh, uh, very much shaped uh, by his experiences uh, um, and his perspective on the first half of the 20th century. Um, and again, I, I won't go into too much detail, not least because I can't, because I'm not uh, 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 particularly, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a great, like, I wouldn't, wouldn't know that much about uh, um, about national economy and about 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 economies. It's it's, it's not my it's not an area that I that I would be particularly uh, um uh, particularly knowledgeable about. Um, but ultimately, Fre Frederick Hayek uh, uh, was kind of saying, look, uh, um, actually, the road to prosperity, uh, the road to uh, 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 to being rich and to being free, uh, um, the best way to achieve this. Uh, um, is not for the state to play uh, um, a very large role in people's lives, uh, uh, not to provide welfare, uh, uh, not to, to really try to organize the economy uh, um, in a very kind of controlling way. Uh, but actually the best way uh, uh, to achieve uh, uh, um, prosperity um, is when the state sort of shrinks back, when the state plays a very minor caretaker role uh, um, of the economy, when it cuts back on national spending, uh, uh, when it cuts back on state controls in general uh, um, of the economy, and it simply allows uh, um, the markets and the capitalist spirit, if you like, uh, um, relatively free reign. Uh, um, so it, it, was, it, was, it was very different, if you like, that, that idea, uh, the idea uh, that economies were best managed when the state stood back uh, um, and did not take such a huge role in people's lives um, and let people get on with it and let people earn money and let people, uh, um, you know, gave people tax breaks, uh, um, you know, so that they could successfully pursue uh, small and medium businesses and that large businesses could create a lot of wealth, uh, which in Hayek's uh, opinion would trickle down uh, um, to the lower levels of society. Um, all of these ideas were quite different, uh, as you can probably see and probably hear from what I'm saying, um, from the way European economies were organized uh, uh, um, under people like Clement Attlee uh, um, and, in, and, and, you know, in, in, uh, um, in the period immediately after the Second World War. This, this was quite a different thing from, uh, um, you know, from the welfare state uh, and, and from this kind of cradle to the grave uh, 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 social contract. Of course, in Hayek's view, 
um, uh, one of the one of the areas that the state would step back from uh, was things like education, was things like healthcare, uh, uh, was things like workers' insurance. Those could be provided uh, privately uh, um, to a much better level, to a much higher level, according to Hayek. Now, it, it must be said, uh, um, uh, and I think I did mention this in a previous lecture, um, that such ideas were not so very different, uh, um, uh, were less different from the way the American economy uh, was and is run. Uh, um, and I suggested, didn't I, uh, that it could be uh, precisely because uh, American society and the American state uh, were not scathed by the Second World War uh, um, in the same way uh, the European societies were. Uh, um, because their economic reconstruction and because uh, um, uh, uh, they had already in the Second World War lifted themselves out of the Great Depression uh, um, and become, you know, capitalist superpower, uh, um, uh, it, you know, that they didn't have this kind of notional restructuring at the end of the Second World War. They didn't think about the welfare state. Um, and to a great extent, they still don't do that. Uh, um, uh, and I mentioned, didn't I, uh, um, that, that if we look back so 10 or so years, uh, and if we look at the Affordable, um, the Affordable Health Care Act uh, that the previous American president, uh, Barack Obama, uh, um, put through, legislated for, uh, um, by European terms, uh, that would not be uh, a particularly radical uh, 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 bill of, bill of health care. Um, it would be considerably less generous than, you know, the French or the German or Scandinavian or even the British NHS. I mean, there are still very large private sectors uh, um, under Obamacare and, and, you know, still a huge amount of health insurance paid for uh, uh, by, uh, by the corporate sector, by the private sector. So uh, um, his ideas maybe were not so different um, in the American context, uh, um, but they were quite different in the European context. Now, Milton Friedman, his, his student at the University of Chicago, uh, um, really kind of expanded those ideas, uh, uh, um, you know, developed them, uh, updated them, uh, um, showed the ways that they might be applicable uh, uh, to contemporary, uh, contemporary societies. Now, Hayek and Friedman, um, it's not that everybody had read them, uh, uh, um, and many people hadn't, and God knows I haven't, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say, uh, um, but there's... Uh, uh, um, Hayek and Friedman's, you know, the, the, those concepts at a very basic level, um, the notion uh, that the welfare state uh, um, and this big role of the state in European economies um, could be rethought uh, um, seemed to, to offer a way out of this sort of problem uh, that had come to Europe with the oil shock and with the recession of the 1970s. Um, people were kind of looking for a way uh, um, to sort of cut back. They, they were asking questions of the economy um, because of this recession, because of this economic downturn that they had not asked uh, previously. And Hayek and Friedman's ideas seemed to offer uh, certain solutions to, uh, 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 to sort of how to move forward with economies, how to cut back, uh, uh, um, how, to, uh, how to save money uh, uh, when money desperately needed to be saved. Okay, now uh, uh, we can come on to slide eight and we can meet the star of uh, uh, today's lecture, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, uh, because Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, and her government and the, the way in which she ran uh, uh, the economy, uh, uh, her government ran the economy and the way uh, she, she ran Great Britain in the 1980s uh, had a lot to do uh, with responding uh, to these kinds of problems uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that, that the United Kingdom uh, had been facing. Now, there's a, there's a, first of all, I, 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 there's a few things I want, to, I want to say about Margaret Thatcher uh, um, to separate her, first, first of all. We'll, we'll talk about her politics momentarily. Uh, um, and these are things that people feel very strongly about. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, one way or the other, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher um, induces in many people, uh, not just in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, very powerful responses uh, for better or for worse. And my God, I can tell you, uh, um, if you ask my father uh, uh, what he thought of Margaret Thatcher, you would get a very lively uh, uh, um, rant, uh, uh, you know, that, that within five minutes you would be sorry uh, uh, that you had asked him. He has very strong feelings uh, uh, about, about Thatcher having lived, uh, uh, lived in the United Kingdom uh, um, in the 1970s um, and the 1980s. Um, M Margaret Thatcher was a very interesting, nevertheless, an inter interesting individual. Uh, um, she did not come uh, from a privileged background. She was a greengrocer's daughter, uh, um, uh, so coming from sort of lower middle class. Uh, um, she went to Oxford University during the Second World War. She studied chemistry. 
Uh, um, she briefly practiced chemistry at the end of the Second World War, but very, very quickly moved into politics uh, and, of course, the politics of the Conservative Party. Now, at the time, uh, uh, so we're talking about the 1950s, the 1960s, um, the British Conservative Party was steeped uh, um, in patriarchal uh, British uh, traditions, uh, um, very conservative, conservative with a small C, uh, um, very few, if any, female MPs. Uh, um, of course, never a party leader who had been a female. Um, very few, uh, I can't think of a single one, actually, uh, female cabinet ministers or ministers in general. Uh, um, the, the leadership of the British Tory party, uh, um, by and large, uh, um, had been schooled in the elite institutions of, of British society. So Eton College, uh, uh, you know, the great private schools. Uh, um, you know, the great colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, uh, Balliol and, uh, uh, um, you know, and uh, uh, All Souls and, and this kind of thing. Uh, um, so it was a very small group of people uh, um, who who's, had come from families and had come from backgrounds that were very wealthy and very privileged uh, um, and had gone through the finishing schools, uh, uh, the elite finishing schools of the elite of, 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 uh, um, of, of British society. And of course, they were all men. Uh, um, so these are sort of things that the Thatcher uh, was facing uh, and which Thatcher managed to break through as she rose up uh, um, uh, the ranks of the, uh, um, the British Tory party, uh, first uh, as an MP, uh, then uh, as a secretary of state. Uh, she was education minister um, and ultimately uh, then, then as the party leader uh, and, and then at the end of the 19, uh, uh, 1970s becoming prime minister of Great Britain, uh, um, uh, defeating uh, James Callaghan, the, uh, uh, the Labour Party uh, leader and the prime minister at the end of the 1970s. So it's a succession of glass ceilings uh, that Margaret Thatcher is breaking through, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, overcoming the obstacles of her class background, uh, overcoming obstacles of her gender, uh, um, overcoming obstacles of, uh, uh, you know, being an outsider uh, from the Tory party establishment, um, really rising to the top uh, um, uh, of this very kind of uh, um, traditional, very kind of uh, uh, conservative uh, uh, organization party, the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, um, you know, these were these were a remarkable series uh, um, of achievements. And whatever one thinks about Thatcher, even her enemies, uh, uh, would acknowledge uh, um, that this showed an incredible sort of uh, um, capacity for work, an incredible capacity uh, for striving and for pushing herself, uh, for pushing herself forward. Uh, um, and, and, you know, there are all kinds of stories about Thatcher. She slept for sort of two hours a night. Um, you know, she never took a day off in sort of 20 years and then and this kind of thing. Uh, um, she was a real kind of, uh, you know, she had this kind of monomaniacal ability uh, 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 for sort of hard work and for endeavor and, and, and for this kind of thing. Now, as I say, if we move on to slide number nine, uh, um, uh, Margaret Thatcher came, uh, became Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1979. Uh, and she came into power on the back uh, um, of a really difficult uh, uh, and, and, and bad uh, economic uh, uh, period, uh, a period in, in Britain's economy. Uh, Britain was going through what was known as the winter of discontent. Uh, the recession had hit the country very hard. Uh, um, there was a three-day working week because people couldn't be paid to work more. Uh, um, uh, garbage was piling up on the streets because there had been uh, a, a strike of refuse workers. Uh, um, things, were in, things were in a very dire situation. Now, uh, um, before Thatcher, there had been J James Callaghan, a Labour government. But before him, at the beginning of the 1970s, there had been a Tory government uh, um, under the Prime Minister Edward Heath. Uh, um, who had been uh, uh, in charge, uh, who had ruled Britain, uh, been in charge of Britain from 1970 to 1974. So Thatcher was her successor, uh, Heath's successor as, uh, um, as, uh, uh, as, as a Tory party leader, uh, but, but also as Tory, uh, uh, Tory prime minister. And her decisions uh, uh, were very much marked by what she saw to be the failures of the 1970s, uh, both of James Callaghan and the Labour government, uh, but also of her own uh, 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 party uh, under Ed he Edward Heath. Um, and Thatcher believed that the problem, particularly with Heath, had been uh, uh, that he had been uh, uh, too uh, uh, keen to try to compromise uh, with his opponents, uh, uh, that he had sought 
uh, um, agreements with things like the trades union movement, uh, uh, with the with the opposition. Uh, um, he had tried to find a middle ground uh, um, through many of the political and the economic problems uh, the United the, the United Kingdom were facing, and there was simply no way of doing this. Uh, um, he had been bullied. Uh, um, you know, Thatcher saw him, perceived him as being too weak. Uh, um, and believed that what was needed, you know, uh, uh, to rule, to, to sort of lead Britain, uh, uh, was a very sort of firm hand, was to be very decisive, uh, um, uh, was to be very confrontational uh, uh, with people who she, she believed uh, uh, were, uh, were, 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 were contributing uh, to this economic and to this political crisis. Now, she was given a nickname, uh, the Iron Lady, uh, uh, by a, a Soviet uh, military gazette uh, um, in the 1970s, back when she, I think she was education minister. Uh, um, she'd been very tough back then as well. Uh, um, and she'd been given the, uh, the nickname uh, uh, Iron Lady, and this had stuck, uh, um, and it seemed to be very well suited uh, to her political personality, uh, um, this, this kind of tough, uncompromising figure. Uh, um, and, you know, if, if we look at the way she ruled Great Britain, if we look at the way she, she, she led Great Britain as prime minister, uh, um, it's very easy to see, it's very easy to make the linkages uh, um, between uh, uh, the necessary way that she strived to overcome these kind of obstacles of her upbringing, uh, um, how she pushed through as a woman uh, uh, um, through these very sort of, uh, uh, you know, these, these, these very uh, 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 large obstacles. Uh, by simply sort of bullheadedly and bloody-mindedly kind of pushing her way through. Um, it's very easy to see how she applied these uh, uh, lessons uh, in, uh, uh, um, you know, du during her time in the 1980s as Prime Minister. Now, she was very unpopular from the get-go, get at least initially, uh, um, and it looked to all extents and purposes uh, that she would be a one-termer. Uh, she had very low approval ratings, uh, um, uh, uh, did not become very popular, uh, um, and it looked like she was on her way out uh, um, in the early 1980s. However, if we move to slide and number 10, uh, something happened uh, um, uh, in 1982, which really transformed the way uh, many people looked at Margaret Thatcher, many people in Great Britain, but in fact, many people in the world as well. Um, in 1982, uh, the Argentine junta, the, uh, the military dictatorship, in uh, um, in uh, um, in Argentina, uh, invaded a small patch of territory uh, uh, which was just off the Argentine coast. Uh, uh, the Argentines were called as the Malvinas. Uh, uh, the British usually refer to these as the Falkland Islands. Uh, um, it had been a leg a legacy. The Falkland Islands were a legacy of the British Empire, uh, uh, but they were still uh, um, uh, an imperial territory, British territory, and they still are uh, um, in the uh, in the twenty first century. Now, the military dictatorship in Argentina, uh, um, believing that this would be quite an easy, uh, 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 quick victory, uh, believing that the British would never be able to mobilize uh, um, uh, uh, any kind of resistance uh, to this takeover um, and in any way, even if they did, if they were able to, they would not have the appetite to do so. Uh, this being the area of decolonization and of, 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 of Western powers uh, uh, backing away from uh, uh, from uh, from imperial territories, uh, believed that this kind of invasion would be over very quickly, um, and it would shore up support for the regime uh, uh, back uh, back in Buenos Aires, back in back in Argentina. Now, Margaret Thatcher, being Margaret Thatcher, saw it differently uh, um, and uh, uh, mobilized uh, um, a uh, um, an expeditionary force to sail halfway across the world from Great Britain. Uh, uh, to the Malvinas, to the Falkland Islands, uh, to reclaim these territories, which she believed should remain, uh, uh, should remain British. Uh, um, so much to the surprise of the world, uh, uh, much to the consternation of many people, uh, um, including uh, very close allies, people like Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, the American president, we'll talk more about him next week, uh, um, uh, um, and much to the surprise even of, of people within her own cabinet, uh, um, Margaret Thatcher launched this expeditionary mission uh, uh, and very quickly routed the Argentine forces um, and reclaimed this very small territory for, uh, uh, for the British. Now, for both sides, we could argue, uh, of course, this is still a, a very controversial issue in, uh, um, in the 21st century, the uh, sovereignty of the, uh, of the Falkland Islands, uh, uh, which uh, remains British. Uh, uh, but which is contested by, by the Argentines, and it must be said by the majority of the United Nations, 
uh, um, who believe that this this needs you know the situation in the in the in the, the fall of the lands needs to change. Uh, um, uh, um, you know that this Togolistan was was quite symbolic. I mean, it's not a huge territory. Uh, uh, several thousand people living on the Malvinas, living on the Falkland Islands, but but nevertheless not a huge kind of conflict, not a huge, uh, not a huge war. Uh, um, it was nevertheless, you know, kind of a symbolic thing. Uh, um, but back home, uh, uh, this created a great spike uh, um, in Thatcher's uh, uh, popularity. Uh, um, you know, all of a sudden she was seen uh, um, not as this annoying. Uh, unpopular woman who 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 sort of had, had you know like a parvenu had sort of let rose rose to the top, uh, um of British society and the British state, uh, but for many people in the United Kingdom, uh, um you know calling this kind of post imperial, uh, uh patriotism or pride, uh, um believed uh, uh, after all the Margaret Thatcher was you know it was tough minded a uh, woman uh, um who would stick up for British interests on the uh, the world stage. Uh, um, and many people had a much more favorable opinion of Thatcher um, as a result of the uh, of the Falkland Islands conflict of the Malvinas conflict. Now Margaret Thatcher applied uh, um, this logic of confrontation and of non compromise, uh, uh, not just abroad and not just in places like the Malvinas, uh, uh, but also at home, uh, to domestic problems. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, she she believed. Uh, um, that this uh, approach that had won her so much popularity uh, um, and had been successful for her in uh, um, uh, abroad in the Malvinas uh, could also be usefully applied back home, uh, back, uh, back in Great Britain. Um, so very often, in fact, routinely, uh, um, Margaret Thatcher would apply the same kind of non-compromising attitude to political problems that emerged uh, back home. Now, most notably and most controversially, uh, um, she did so against the trades union movement in the middle of the 1980s, and particularly in 1984 and 1985. This is slide number 11. Now, Margaret Thatcher uh, um, believed uh, um, that the trades unions, uh, um, uh, those unions which organized labor, uh, particularly the mining, uh, the coal uh, and the steel unions, uh, uh, were causing many of the economic and the political problems that the country was facing. Now, it's certainly true uh, that in the middle of the 1980s, uh, the United Kingdom, its, its economy and its industry was transforming, uh, um, just as other parts of Europe were as well, just as Belgium, as Germany and France, West Germany and France were. Uh, um, those economies were moving away uh, from industry um, and moving into different areas, moving into things like nuclear power, uh, um, into finance. You know, the, the economy was starting to shift into other areas. So this needed to be managed, this needed to be dealt with, uh, uh, certainly. Uh, um, uh, but Margaret Thatcher's decision, uh, uh, the way she handled this sort of deindustrialization, uh, uh, was in a very stark kind of way, it was to sort of see down the unions. Uh, um, uh, you know, in, in her mind, uh, she believed that what was hobbling the British economy uh, to a great extent uh, uh, was the power of these unions, uh, uh, the inefficiency of these mines. Uh, um, uh, um, and under basically the best way to deal with this was to sort of stare them down, was to confront them. Now, it is also certainly true that in the 1970s, uh, under Edward Heath and then under James Callaghan, uh, um, both of those governments, uh, um, I, I wouldn't say that they had been hostages uh, of, uh, um, of the trades union movement, but they had certainly uh, uh, found their room for maneuver uh, uh, marginalized or minimized uh, by, the, by, by the trades unions. They had a lot of trouble uh, uh, with their militant leaders uh, uh, um, who were very sort of Marxist and very, you know, very sort of, uh, um, you know, very radical sort of people. Uh, um, so th this was something that the Thatcher believed uh, had been the downfall uh, uh, particularly of Edward Heath's government uh, um, in the nineteen uh, um, in the nineteen seventies, um, so she sort of really faced them down. Uh, uh, um, you know these huge pit closures, uh, um, this massive scaling down uh, um, of industry in the Midlands and in the north of England. Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher approached this in a very non compromising way. Um, she saw the unions' leaders. Uh, um, and particularly a man called Arthur Scargill, uh, um, who was the leader of the National Union of Mine Workers, he was a very militant uh, uh, Marxist, um, saw him, uh, um, uh, as indeed he saw her, uh, um, 
as an enemy, uh, um, as somebody who needed to be defeated uh, um, along the lines of, uh, um, you know, of the Argentinian dictatorship or something like this. So she was really, I mean, she even called them the enemy within. She was, she was facing these people down and, and, and treating them uh, uh, um, as if they were, you know, not political uh, people, people as part of the same political society, but, but people who needed to be sort of, uh, um, uh, needed to be defeated, if you like, needed to be crushed. Now, uh, um, you, you can read more about this in Buchanan's book and in Tony Judd's book, uh, um, but the darkest period of, of this was sort of 1984 and 1985. Uh, um, the unions uh, called a strike, uh, believing uh, uh, that this would bring Thatcher's government to the, uh, um, you know, to the negotiating table, uh, uh, that it would force her to compromise, that it would force her to back down. Uh, but Margaret Thatcher didn't break back, back down. Uh, um, she called in strike breakers. Uh, uh, she called in people uh, uh, to sort of do this work for them. Uh, um, and eventually, uh, I think in 1985, the Nottinghamshire, mine is Nottinghamshire, it's a county uh, um, in the Midlands of, uh, of England, uh, um, eventually went back to work. Uh, uh, this broke down uh, the morale uh, um, and the uh, solidarity of the Yorkshire miners, it was the other big mining mining union. Uh, um, and, and so this general strike, this mass strike that the miners had called, ultimately failed uh, um, uh, um, and Thatcher got her way. Uh, she was able to sort of pass through this deindustrialization. I can tell you a very quick anecdote. When I was at university uh, as an undergraduate, uh, um, I went to Nottingham University uh, and the porter in the student dormitory uh, that I lived in for my first year, uh, was a man named Mike, uh, was a local guy, uh, came, from, came from Nottingham, uh, was a guy, so about 20 years ago, uh, and at the time the guy uh, was in his 50s, uh, um, but he had been a miner, uh, um, uh, and, and he, he you know, used to tell us, he used to tell me uh, that you know, he'd gone down the mines when he left school at the age of 16, uh, and he'd worked there for about 15 years af after that. Um, uh, um, and he, you know, he used to say, well, look, you know, we, we, we sort of, we, we in Nottingham, uh, uh, we, we were simply living like kings. We, we worked hard. It was tough work. We went down these mines, you know, five days a week. Uh, um, it was hard physical labor, uh, but it was well paid. It was lucrative. Um, and we really used to sit around in the pubs laughing uh, um, at people like you, he said to me, like a student, uh, or teachers, or accountants, uh, um, or, or, or people who would go to university, uh, um, because that just seemed like a waste of time. Uh, why would anyone want to do that when you could leave school on Friday, and on Monday you could be down the pits, uh, um, and you could be earning good money? Uh, um, now, of course, Mike uh, ultimately was a victim uh, um, of this uh, economic transformation. Um, he lost his job in the mine uh, um, and he came to work uh, uh, at this university and was working as a porter. Uh, um, but he was a lucky person in many ways. M many people of Mike's uh, generation would simply not have found work. Uh, um, they would have gone on into sort of long-term unemployment, uh, uh, what, what was called at the time structural unemployment. Uh, they would not have found new, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, new places to work, uh, uh, new, uh, new, new, new outlets uh, uh, for their labor. Uh, um, so this, this really did, uh, um, whether or not it was a, 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 an economically necessary thing, uh, um, perhaps at a certain level it was, or partially it was, uh, but nevertheless, the way it was executed, uh, um, the manner in which Thatcher's government approached this issue uh, created a lot of hardship for a lot of people, um, entire communities uh, um, that had, you know, since the 19th century, uh, uh, villages and towns and, and even cities like places like Sheffield uh, um, in the north of England uh, and Yorkshire, uh, uh, which, had, which had evolved uh, um, and which had sort of you know, grown up around uh, uh, around the mines, around steel and around coal, uh, um, were completely sort of gutted, uh, completely sort of ripped up. Uh, um, you know, there were places with, with sort of 80, 90 percent unemployment. Uh, um, so it was a very difficult period uh, of transition. Uh, um, and, 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 and this, I think, more than anything, uh, um, is where, uh, you know, much of the, the hostility uh, um, and much of the bitterness uh, of Thatcher's years uh, came from. Now, uh, if, if we move on to slide 12, uh, um, uh, uh, in the last sort of five or so minutes, um, in, in, uh, um, uh, the other thing that, that is very important uh, um, in uh, Thatcher's uh, uh, economic and political policies, and one which is, whose importance extends beyond 
uh, uh, Great Britain is the uh, uh, privatization uh, uh, that Mac the Thatcher's government undertook uh, uh, during the mid 1980s. Um, again, it's part of this kind of Hayek Friedman sense that the state must step back uh, um, from uh, uh, from its role as the organizing force in uh, um, in society. Uh, um, in the 1980s, uh, Thatcher's government uh, had a massive, if you like, fire sale uh, um, of nationalized parts of the economy. Um, so the rail services, telecommunications, water, gas, uh, uh, parts of the media, television, radio, although of course the BBC, uh, uh, that great British institution uh, uh, remained largely untouched, largely, largely intact. Uh, parts of the health service, uh, 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 private sectors in the health service uh, were opened up, were created. Uh, um, this was very much part of Thatcher's economic philosophy and the philosophy of her government. Uh, um, they believed uh, um, that if these inefficient and if these failing uh, uh, nas parts of the national economy uh, uh, were subjected to market forces, to competitive market forces, um, they would become much more, uh, um, much more, uh, um, much more uh, um, competitive and much more successful. Uh, 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 you know, they would provide a better service because there, there would be competition, there would be tenders between, uh, you know, just like different rail companies. Uh, um, the consumer, the customer, the average Britain uh, uh, could decide uh, which gas company they wanted, which electron electric company they wanted, uh, which communications company they wanted. Uh, um, Thatcher believed uh, um, that these, these parts of the economy needed to be sort of opened up uh, uh, need to be handed over to the private private sector. Now, again, it's controversial uh, about whether or not this was successful. Uh, um, you know, some some people say it was, some people say it wasn't. Uh, um, uh, um, British Rail. Uh, um, I, I would have been quite young, but I do remember traveling on it a few times in the nineteen eighties. Uh, um, and I, I guess I could say two things: the service was was pretty bad, uh, uh, but it wasn't expensive. Uh, um, it was also very cheap. Uh, now, if you travel by train in the United Kingdom, it's as, as some of you undoubtedly will have done or will do. Uh, um, it's unbelievably expensive, uh, um, but uh, you know that the service is relatively good, uh, um, better better than it was uh, uh, pre privatization. Uh, um, so whether you think that it's worth spending that money uh, 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 to get this service is, I, I, I guess, a kind of a, a personal personal question. Um, Thatcher's policies of privatization uh, uh, were picked up. Uh, um, by many, uh, we'll come to this later on in our in our uh, uh, lecture series. But Thatcher's uh, um, uh, Thatcher's policies of uh, privatization were picked up by many uh, uh, of the uh, post communist economies and societies in the nineteen nineties. So places like Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, um, who of course had entirely nationalized economies under socialism, uh, but wanted to try to change these uh, um, into the private sector as quickly as possible. Uh, um, for many people, uh, um, one example would be the, uh, the Czech uh, um, Prime Minister, Czechoslovak Prime Minister, uh, um, uh, Václav Klaus, in, in, in the early 1990s, uh, believed that Thatcher's program of privatization was, uh, 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 you know, was an effective means of achieving this economic transformation. Um, so, you know, in many ways, uh, many of Thatcher's policies and many of Thatcher's ideas, for better or for worse, uh, uh, were uh, adapted uh, um, uh, and were picked up uh, um, by states outside uh, um, of the United Kingdom who, was, who were undergoing, uh, uh, albeit at different times, similar challenges of economic transformation, uh, um, of political transformation of uh, um, of these uh, of, of these uh, of these sorts of things, uh, um, so Thatcher, uh, um, is certainly an important figure in the United Kingdom, um, but also I would argue, and I've tried to argue in today's lecture, which I'm afraid has run over time slightly, also a very important figure, uh, uh, more generally uh, uh, for uh, for European uh, European politics. Thank you.